You're listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club Podcast, an audio book club. Greetings, Explorers. I'm one of your hosts, Johnny, joined by... Dennis. And sadly, no Francis for this one. Today, we are discussing The Golden Age, book one, by writers Roxanne Morel and Cyril Pedrosa. I probably butchered their names <laughs> with my terrible French accent. Oui, <laughs> oui. Cyril is also the artist for this book. We hope you've read today's title because all three of us have read the book. So beware, spoilers ahead. Explorers can share their opinions and thoughts with us by leaving a comment on our Facebook page or over on Twitter and Instagram at GN Explorers Club. Graphic Novel Explorers Club is available wherever fine podcasts are found, including YouTube. Well, first, welcome back to our fifth season of the podcast. Happy to be back, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Maybe Lucky number five, man. Yeah, <laughs> that's a new one. I haven't heard, but <laughs> now we're still re- recording these remotely in our separate homes. So our sound is still not like what it was when we were in the studio. And with that in mind, Frankie won't be joining us for the foreseeable future because of some technical issues she's experiencing with the remote recording service that we're using. We're still trying to figure that out. Hopefully we'll get her back here. Not too long. I hope we get her back sometime this season. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and until that time, we'll have some guest hosts or we'll just be the two of us. Your least uh, two favorite two hosts. <laughs> <laughs> Building castles in the sky. Just the two of us. We just lost every single viewer or listener we have ever had. Dennis That's okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we hopefully uh, we can get these resolved so she can fulfill her contract and we don't have to sue her in court oh, for yeah. a breach of breach contract. So. I was going to go <laughs> serve her some papers, but then we decided to <laughs> We can't serve her. We have to get up. <laughs> we have to get a court service or someone else to to oh. serve her. So. But also we hope we're to have her back because uh the show's just not the same without her. I right. love having Frankie on the show. Whoa, whoa, don't imply that I don't mean that. <laughs> I, I did. I, I didn't hear any words out of your mouth about. I well, I, you were just talking. I obviously miss <laughs> Frankie probably more than Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, now it's a competition. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this episode is going to be slightly longer than we normally have been doing as of uh, recent because we're just catching up, getting everyone up to date. We also have a couple interactions with some listeners of the show. We're going to mention here in a second. But first, uh, the book we're doing, The Golden Review, again, written by Roxanne Moriel. Golden Age, man. What's that? <laughs> is it? You said Golden Review. Oh, <laughs> come on, man. I'm sorry. He's drinking, folks. <laughs> so, <laughs> to, get, to get back to the book, The Golden Age, not the review. Uh, and not the Beck song. Yeah. That's Mellow Gold, right? Oh, no, that was the album. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. It's written by Roxanne Morial and Cyril Pedrosa. He also illustrated it. It was published in February of 2020. So just last year. Um, a quick note about the authors. I was looking them up a little bit because I'd, I'd never heard of either two of them. Oui. They are French. They are part of an art collective called Maison Fumetti, which is dedicated to comics. And mm. apparently they do this like they look for other partnerships, like it's an author and a and an artist, oh. um, like exclusively a duo. Uh, and, they, and they publish their work. She or he, I'm sorry, Cyril previously worked in animation for Disney, including the Hercules movie and Hunchback of Notre Dame. And I'm curious if they're like, hire a Frenchie. So <laughs> we have some authentic French person working on here. But uh, I definitely feel some Hercules vibes from the art, but yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, this, this, this artistic style, I can, I can feel some of that. But yeah, we can go into that later. Yeah, I don't think he did character design or anything like that no. I, it, on, on the, um, or the Hercules movie, but he just he did like scene animation or something mm. like that. So okay, well first uh, we're gonna read some listener reviews or listener comments here. These are from YouTube actually, where we post up episodes. First up is uh, World Cup Willie, which is a pretty good name. <laughs> I'm assuming this guy's uh, British or European, since he uh, World World Cup Willie. It's not you know he likes football. <laughs> yeah, football, not football Americana. Uh, uh, he, this is in re- regards to the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, episode 58. And World Cup Willie wrote, Hooray, let's review a novel that two of us flicked through and missed half of the important plot points. 
I think that's kind of a legit gripe. What do you? Yeah, I mean, we. I try to read the books as well as I can, but yeah, there are times where I, I sometimes the story spaces out. I forget how I felt about the book. To be perfectly mm, honest, all three of us had <laughs> found some of the stuff problematic, like the sexual assault scenes, like when uh, he when um, the Invisible Man when they go to find him for mm-hmm. the first time and locate him, and he's at the uh, this is oh. like Paragary's school of right young woman refinement something like that and he's Mm -hmm. he's basically well not basically he is sexually assaulting pollyanna and then the a couple times of where mina is in peril and she's nearly raped too Mm -hmm. there were some other things that we have problems with too like the portrayal of the asian characters in the story and oh um, right and frankie just didn't have any interest in the book because we've read stories where in her defense a lot of sexual assault yeah, that and there's just gratuitous violence and mm-hmm. uh, and we've sort of become, I think, sensitive to it mm-hmm. um, where we're just like, do we really need any more of this? And it'll it turned her off from finishing the story. So it's just it's just kind of flipped through it. So I get where he's coming from. I get where Wool Cup Willie is coming from. But well, you know, and to be fair, I mean, we're, we in no way say we're serious like comics journalists or anything like that. We're coming from the angle of more casual readers and, you know, someone uh, milling about a, a comic shop and, and, and flipping through to find something interesting. And so I see where he's coming from. I mean, it's obviously a beloved series, as is many of our books that we've reviewed and not necessarily have liked. But, I mean, you know, opinions are opinions. It's not fact. So, you know... We just didn't like it, but that doesn't invalidate anyone else enjoying the book at all. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up, same same comic book is Don Sergio Salazar, who wrote Victorian literature meets the modern Victorians and their winging. <laughs> so I'm not sure. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming he meant whining. Victorian literature meets the modern Victorians and their whining, maybe. I'm not sure why we're the modern Victorians. Because Victorians were shocked at violence. So I guess. No, they but, they were quite violent. I don't know. I'm I'm assuming it might be this. Does he mean that we are initiating sweeping progress in regards to comic book industrial revolution? Or that we're imposing long working hours for the people working in our warehouses in the uh, Graphic Novel Explorers Club warehouse? Or perhaps that we're aware that we abolished the rule that one need not own property to run for graphic novel explorers clubs parliament. <laughs> Cause before, uh, every- if you were in our parliament, you had to own land. We abolished that like a year or two ago. <laughs> so for our orders. Yeah. <laughs> Which actually is somewhat part of the golden age. There yes. is a huge uh, part of this book is about, the rights of the people and uh, that's that's sort of the backdrop of the story taking place i would say it's maybe like the secondary story is right yeah yeah. no for sure i mean it takes place in a fictional medieval land and travers a-n-t-r-e-v-e-r-s right but regardless it it definitely has some revolutionary thoughts in terms of how people are treated how you know the servants of of a kingdom should be treated, etc. Yeah, yeah. So the background on the story: it takes place in, like we said, the fictional kingdom of Antraviers, which is in turmoil. The common people are, are nearing a revolt due to the harsh rules and high taxes. The king, King Ronan, was recently passed away, and the heir to his throne, Princess Tilda, is of uh, the mindset to make things better for her subjects. Which puts her in like direct contrast with some other parties that are in the ruling class that don't see that as being a problem. But before her coronation, she is forced to flee because of the actions of her younger brother, who's a child, and her mom and an advisor. So joining her as she flees for her life is Tancred, a knight loyal both to her and her father, and then his squire, Bertrill. And I had to look up what the ranking system is for knights. Mm. So I was like, what is Bertrand? Cause he's not quite a knight. It seems like he's like, he's still studying. 
right. learning the ways of knighthood. So it's Paige. Paige is the person that like carries the gear, grooms the horse. Is you mm-hmm. know you're not quite there. Squire is sort of like the next class up before you mm-hmm. become a knight. So I had to look that up. My apologies <laughs> for not knowing that, but I am not into medieval swords and sorcery shit. I used to be when I was a kid, uh, big time. Like I used to watch uh, PBS specials on castles. I there was like these kid books that were geared oh, towards castles. That were like some of them were animated. They would show you right. how the like, inner castles. Those were pretty good. I, those I liked. They, and they had cutaways where they would show the life and like everything. And yeah, they had specials tied to those books, and I was super into that. Mm. Uh, which is also how I kind of got into D and D, but yeah. <laughs> Getting back to the story, which moves very, very quickly. This is a, oh, a yeah. fast paced story. We're introduced to the three minor characters who are these three minor characters who are poaching on the King's land. And that's how we're kind of introduced to this is like, it, it's really a book ended by the, by these minor characters. And then the main part of the story is like fills in between. Which reminds me a lot of like Unforgiven, how Unforgiven opens and closes is mm-hmm. with the the mom of William Money's deceased wife coming into like what happened. I I had heard my daughter died. I want to know what happened. Then she finally gets there and the story takes place in between. And then she arrives at the end and finds out that he left. So right. it's like that where it's kind of bookended by these like tertiary characters. Um, Which we should note, the story is not done. It's the the book is bookended, but there's I'm sure more to the story. Yeah, book two. I I, I had read it's going to be a duology. It's mm. it'll be a two part story. But uh, yeah, the story moves quickly. Princess Tilda is put into danger by her own brother and her mom, and then this other character, Vodemont, who's an advisor to the king and now the prince. I I would really like to see the backstory on what the relationship was between him and the king because uh, because there's so much uh, oppression happening and, and like the king seems love but it's like well this was happening under your rule so right so let me uh get to that what do you think i mean we've talked about this a few different books but uh, in terms of world building you feel like it gave you enough to be vested or did you feel like I'm really confused and I don't like how this is laying the story out? No, I felt vested like very fast. Like the the minor characters, which are these these two guys, and then one who had, the third one who's who's like mentally disabled, but st- still seems to have insight that the other two aren't mm-hmm. grasping. Bring you up to speed very quickly on like, hey, uh, you know, like don't don't talk to the when when this other this lord or something yeah it comes through to like pay you know pay honorific to the deceased king and 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 tilda's what was supposed to be her her crowning they they get you in there really really fast like and up to speed like okay yeah there's definitely a class system here there's more going on than we're aware of and and the great thing that they do in the illustrating is you'll be far away and up close but you get to see as as characters move around, pushing the story, they're physically pushing the story forward. I, I would agree. I I loved the use of those guys as tools for exposition. And yeah. I felt like, yeah, I, I got just enough world building without being too heavy on text. And speaking to what you just mentioned, I thought that was really interesting I've, I normally only see that like maybe in a Spider-Man comic where they're trying to show him flip. So they'll show yeah. different versions of him in, in different poses as he's flipping kind of slightly faded. And then through the panels through the panels. And then the final solid color version is him completing the move, but he's never really talking during that. It's just to show the motion. And it was interesting. And they've used it a few times through there. And I actually was initially slightly confused, but then I totally bought into it the use of that where as they're talking, you're following their trail of conversation and their path physically through with multiple versions of them. And it's not through multiple panels. It's one like large panel where with different little versions of the road or through through a town. And I like it. Yeah. As they move through the forest, they'll they'll go into some water and then come out of it and walk out the other side while they're on horseback. 
yeah, it's really it was done really well. I had no problems following what was going on as they moved, which I'm curious. I would love to know like how many test drawings the the artist had to do to like figure that out. It is fascinating, like when you're a comic artist and or the author and, and you're trying to both work in a collaborative environment to to convey the words in a proper manner. Like, how do you break free of norms, right? The the yeah. so many panels or whatever, and just just go with this kind of the, some of the the artistic directions they they made in this. Which I, by the way, I'll just spoilers. I love the art. I wasn't sure how they chose it, but it worked for me in terms of like the weird use of like negative colors. And what not all mm-hmm. of it was a negative. I mean, like when you see a photo negative where faces aren't the natural color, they're like this dark blue to black and and everything else outlining them is white. I'm not sure exactly where they made those choices and it must have been super difficult not to go with whatever the norm is, but whatever it was, it paid off. Yeah. No, the art in this is amazing. I, I absolutely love it. it. It somewhat reminds me of like a block print. Like I thought maybe- I thought the same thing. I thought it was maybe like a multicolored block print that they had done. I was like, that must have been labor intensive, but- I, I'm, I, I, I doubt that it's probably done through an illustrating program, but it's done wonderfully. It, it calls back to like some of the Disney animations, like the 101 Dalmatians, like some of the character designs, because they're very, I don't want to say harsh, but like characters jaws will be like completely sunken in to show mm-hmm. like how stiff they are. I don't know. You get, you get a sense of the character's personality through the way they're illustrated. Um, For sure. I don't know when they draw someone who's overweight. It's I, I just like the way it's done, like big fat gut with tiny little spindly legs or uh, <laughs> really big noses, like character right. caricature noses. It's done really well, really yeah, really col- well. The colors, the like you said, the the fact that it looks like a block print, it's just amazing, and, and it's not your conventional palette either. It's just it's just weird. I don't yeah, know. things. It's almost like contrast, like those a lot of the stuff shouldn't work together. Like the colors shouldn't work together, but they do. Right. Like in some, in some cases, the background is that negative tone I I mentioned, whereas the person is actually the natural colors they would be. And it's just, it's fascinating. And like, I, I would be curious to have a conversation with uh, both of them to figure out how they decided to agree upon the artistic direction for the book, because it really does work very well. Yeah. They must've worked hand in hand to have the story and, the art mm-hmm. run together so seamlessly. It's not like he's a contract artist who was hired, but like, hey, come in and do this for us. Um, right. And, and it's still, you know, I'm sure there is a conversation that happens, but, you know, especially some of the design choices, you know, it, I, I feel like they definitely must have collaborated on that. So most of the story takes place with Tilda on the run. She's severely injured while they're getting away. And then they wind up finding a hidden community that's run by women and they, they work together. It's a, it's a commune. They work together and they make decisions as a group and men are usually not welcome there. So when Tancred and, and Brett Bertrell are there, it presents its own problems for this group, which I thought was going to be more. I thought that was going to be the bulk of the story is them being there. Right. And it's not not at all. It's I mean, it's pretty quickly, spoiler alert, they're within a matter of days being there, they wind up getting kicked out of there. Right. Uh, Definitely had a like a Wonder Woman kind of uh Themyscira kind of feel to it. But they're not warrior. I should emphasize they're not like a warrior class of women. These are you know, they're just regular women. Some of them are actually learning, I think, martial arts, as well as others are doing other well, things. It's it's almost like a, a temple like a Shaolin temple where they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're gardening, they're learning, they're reading and writing and like taking classes. But yes, they also learn to fight and defend themselves too with like bow sticks and like swords. And, and then in, in this community, there's some intrigue going on, which I don't want to spoil because it's a pretty big reveal. And the community is like not as, as tight and peaceful as you would think. I'll just say that. So, an additional part of this is that Princess Tilda is having these hallucinations or like waking dreams that reminded me of sort of the legend of Joan of Arc. Oh, yeah, for sure. 
Um, and I was like, oh, I'm curious that this was somehow influenced by Joan and Arc, given, given that, you know, oh, both of the, mm-hmm. yeah, both of the creators are from France. Yeah, I'd really like to talk to them just to like, what, how did you come up with the story and what's it about? Or not what it's about, but like, what were the influences here? What did you pull from? Yeah. And, you know, really, once I finished the story, it definitely had vague uh, illusions or vague uh, similarities to like a Game of Thrones or something like yeah. that. But I definitely, and we've spoken about this before, uh, there are some comic books where they really want to be, you know, Quentin Tarantino or they really want to like show their influences. And sometimes it's just it, less of an homage to us and more of almost a blatant ripoff. And for this, I definitely felt some elements of different stories, but all of it uh, was woven so well together and the original elements were so good. I didn't feel like this was just a copycat of something. This definitely feels uh, its own creature. And I definitely uh, really loved what they've done so far in this book. And I, I'm very vested in, uh, into uh, reading the second one for sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely want to read that when it comes out. But getting back to her hallucinations or waking dreams, a lot of them are her becoming a warrior and, and like this, like like a warrior king, which reminded me of the hallucinations that Prince Ambrose had in Fables. Did you ever did you ever mm-hmm. read that that series? So in Fables, he is his his character is sort of a, a a comedic relief for much of the series, and then it turns out he's a much more powerful person than anyone thinks he is, and he winds up creating this kingdom called Haven where blood cannot be shed there it's a very peaceful environment and he is given the opportunity to take over this this thing that gives their main adversary all this power they're like oh if you you can use this for your own power if you want and he and he has this like waking hallucination of like oh if i do that i i will become the thing i'm supposed to to be defending against and Mm -hmm. that's kind of what this reminded me of like I can't tell if she's supposed to be a benevolent force in these dreams because she often it's like bloody, you know, she winds up right. killing some people while she's in this hallucination or waking dream. So I'm like, I'm not sure if her being a warrior is a good thing or a bad thing. Right. You don't know if it's going to be an Anakin thing, right? Where, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> you know, he starts off as a good guy and then obviously ends up not. So maybe she starts off with good intentions and you can see that. When she feels that someone has betrayed her, her her reaction is not kind. No, and, uh-uh. and you know, initially she seems very much like you know I want to bring essentially democracy to the people, right? But there are times where she's like, know your place, you know, yeah, who, who are you talking to, kind of thing, and it's like, mm, are you really as altruistic as you seem? <laughs> yeah, or or is it the thing of you know absolute power corrupts absolutely. In fact, after she kills a couple people in this waking dream state, she actually weeps. She weeps tears of blood. And as time passes, she starts getting these blotches that almost look like birthmarks. They mm-hmm. start to spread across her, her body and her and her younger brother has one on his face. And so I was curious of like, oh, what? I'm, I, I'm like, does this represent you are being corrupted by power? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Did you catch the tears or? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I wasn't. I was I wasn't sure, especially with that waking dream, what was happening, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be one of those cases where, you know, someone wakes up from a nightmare and they've accidentally killed innocent people. It wasn't. Into, I had to reread that a couple of times to realize that they were actually bad guys. Fortunately, and she was actually fighting them in her waking dream. But yeah, yeah. there's some weird symbolism and some weird stuff going on in terms of yeah those those splotches that I'm not entirely sure what's going on with that. Yeah, because they're spreading more and more. Right. Uh, At first, I thought she just wasn't washing her hands. <laughs> I was like, man, you've been going a long time with that blood on your hands. It's a dirty-ass princess. <laughs> so, from there, they're forced to flee because they're not, some of those warriors weren't just warriors. One of them was seeing one of the women that lives in the commune, secretly seeing each other. So It, it seemed clear that they had basically tortured him to figure out the information. Later, he was seeing one of the women there, though, for a while. Right, right. But it seemed yeah. like later, he they found him, they tortured him, and that's how they were able to come up, 
up across this place. Yeah. After they're after they flee, they they move to another part of this kingdom where they have a sympathetic like lord who rules over part of the land, and that's when we really see that this kingdom is falling apart. Like the common folk have now, we find out have killed several lords or like leaders in this in the southern part of the community where they thought they would be safe and she's almost as as much a danger from these common folks who have taken up who are now revolting as she would be if as she is from the this um her 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 mom and the and the uh, brother right so this is where we get into like almost a moral gray area because you know, obviously coming from uh, a modern democracy, we're like, yeah, you know, uprise against your uh, oppressors, but they're kind of a mindless mob, at least they're portrayed that way. And they're coming against this old Lord who, you know, he's blind. He's actually, he cares about the people who serve him and he's, he's asked them to leave so that they don't get in danger. But then again, he's also part of the establishment. So I, I can see where the common folk are coming from regarding yeah. that. So it's kind of, conflicting it's like they want to the uh, the main characters want to bring some more enlightenment to uh the kingdom but at the same time those who they would hopefully ally themselves with are kind of being violent yeah 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 well i mean really it's like are those people even approachable for her mm-hmm. i'm sure we'll find out in the second book more of this but can she even approach them to say look i'm on your side if you if you help me retake my kingdom i will you know, grant you the the freedoms that you want and, and allow you to make more decisions or if they're just like, nope, off with their head. Yeah. In some ways, I mean, it's not the same thing, but in some ways, uh, it's what I really liked about Rogue One Star Wars, that they showed parts of the Rebel Alliance that weren't necessarily goody two shoes. You know, they yeah. were assassins, they were spies, and they had to do some awful stuff to some people who weren't 100% innocent, but weren't also you know, the main bad guy. And yeah. so, you know, during these revolutionary times, sometimes not everything is clean cut where these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. There's some very moral gray areas that are crossed uh, and that have to be crossed in order for that revolution to happen. Yeah. And to continue. Mm-hmm. So. And finally, Tilda starts to learn more and more about this magic box that her father left clues for her to find and recover, which I think maybe tie into the discoloring she's getting on her on her body but but when she finds it her mother is there with her younger brother and we come to find out that the mom kind of put all this in motion so that tilda would discover the box right and then Um, the fact that she chose her brother to basically become king at first the mother played innocent and said you know it's out of my hands but it, 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 it it it's clear that the mother is the chief uh puppeteer behind all this and that the brother is easily manipulated while as the the daughter tilda is not and because of that the mother realized that she had to choose the son to become king in order for her to be able to be the puppeteer but she wanted to find this magic box that her husband had hidden and had spoken about it during his i guess he was in a coma for a while so during his delirious phase he would speak about it so she basically manipulated the situation in order for her daughter to find this box yeah i'm really curious if in the second book we'll get more if there will be some backstory, I, I'd really would like to know more about the king and like what what set all of this in motion. If we don't get a uh, conclusion in, in book two, I hope that this is one of those rare cases where I would love a prequel where we already know what's happened, but kind of an origin story as to, like you said, what set all this in, into motion. Because it's clear whatever is in the box, the king didn't want anything didn't want to be a part of any of it in the sense of like, he didn't seem to take any treasures or bring it back to his kingdom. He basically sealed it off and made it a hidden area so that no one else would, would uh, obtain this box and whatever power it holds. Except to his daughter. Like I got the impression like that was, you know, or like to protect it. Like it's not made yeah. clear. So it may be, she, he just wanted her to be aware of it so that she knew how dangerous it was so that she would go on protecting it. Assuming that she was, going to be the heir who was going to rule. So as the the ruler, you would need to know that this is an important place and you need to protect it at all costs. So not necessarily yeah. utilize the device, but know that it's dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Interesting. So, okay. Well, overall, I, I probably don't need to ask this, but what do you think of the book? Amazing, amazing uh, story, amazing artwork. Like I, I can't emphasize again how symbiotic the artwork and, and writing are in order to make this a book, uh, this book successful. I love the characters. I love the character designs. Even though it does have kind of that Disney esque look to it, it's definitely gory, but not over the top gory. There is blood. There's killing. It, it's. I felt a good balance, and I, f- I, f- I, f- I feel very interest in this story. Once again, there isn't a whole lot of exposition. What they give you is enough to kind of get you wrapped around and invested in the story itself. So yeah, I de- wow. I'm definitely recommending it and definitely uh, get it book two if you have a chance to. Yeah. I can't say it any better than that, Dennis. That was a, uh, yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's an amazing book. One, oh, one thing I forgot to, to bring up was uh, Princess Tilda. Yeah. will definitely check people and like say, know your place but then she also seems to have a budding romance with uh Bertrell, the the young squire at one point she's like you know just needs to be consoled and he like they lie in bed together not sexually but just right he, you know kind of spooning so that she can get some comfort you know just like another person there for her so i'd be curious to see how that relationship works out in the second book too but right well i think that's it thanks for joining us for the first episode of our fifth season really happy to be back Again, hopefully Frankie can join us. Also, we would like to dedicate this season to our our pets that passed away. Dennis's dog, Spooky. Coolest little dog ever, Spooky. Passed away last year. And then my cat, our, our older dog, Chester and Franny, passed away. So, pour some kibble out for our pups. <laughs> uh, if you have pets, hold them tight. They're, they're never here long enough. We really miss our mutts and our cat. So Yes. Definitely. Dedicate the season to Spooky, Franny, and Chester. So, uh, thanks for listening. If people want to follow us, uh, where do they do that, Dennis? Uh, on Twitter and Instagram, at GN Explorers Club. Cool. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll be back again with a new episode. Later. Uh, stretch it out. Stretch. Okay. Hi, I'm a complete <laughs> asshole. <laughs>